Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, that's going to be a very difficult session to follow, but we'll uh, we'll do the best that we can. Um, before I start, I did want to again give thanks to various groups and individuals who made today's event possible. Uh, that of course includes ACS and the Hewlett Foundation, uh, the LPE Project. Corinne Blaylock is here. Uh, and the Georgetown University Law Center administration uh, for financial support, staffing, and the like. Um, and I want to give a special thanks to the Georgetown events team, especially Claire Sanfilippo. I'm not sure she's in the room, but she's really done a, a, a ton of work in, 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 um, in helping on every aspect of this, as well as the uh, Georgetown Department of Public Safety, uh, who got brought in um, to, to help with uh, Congressman Raskin's security. Um, I don't want to talk a ton on today's panel. Uh, we're a little behind time. Uh, and also, more importantly, I want to hear from our speakers. Um, but I'll say just a little bit about what we're going to do here and how it fits into the day's agenda. You know, as Willie said on the first panel, and as we've been talking about, so many deep questions of political economy have historically been understood as constitutional questions. And so this panel has, I think, uh, two goals. Uh, a first goal, a major goal, is to explore how issues of constitutional political economy are now playing out in policy proposals and social movement organizing and in practical politics today. Um, this happens, you know, as we all realize, at a moment when progressive victories, or longstanding progressive rules and, and background institutions are being eviscerated by the court uh, in areas, you know, as wide ranging as reproductive freedom, voting rights, affirmative action and higher education and elsewhere, unions ability to organize and to exert real power. It also happens at a moment of historic social movement organizing across many different issue areas. Uh, you know, again, including a green transition, LGBTQ plus rights, racial justice in higher education and in politics, antitrust and corporate power, reproductive freedom, right? We've seen a real upswing uh, in innovative organizing over the last decade or so. So this topic of how to bring together constitutional political economy and concrete uh, policy proposals is quite timely. You know, how do we build a progressive political and constitutional alternative today, one that links up movement organizing uh, and this type of work? Um, a second goal of this panel, briefly, is just to link up theories of constitutional political economy also to research in law and political economy. Um, and we'll say a bit more about that and, and also think a bit about how, you know, those forms of research, those bodies of research relate to older liberal and left uh, legal scholars' efforts to understand the distribution of power and the, and the role of law uh, in our polity and society. Okay, um, and I guess final preliminary, one issue that I do hope we'll take up is how the three elements of the democracy of opportunity tradition can work together today. Uh, again, restraints on oligarchy, a political economy that sustains a broad middle class, and of course, a commitment to racial and gender inclusion, which historically has not always been as central uh, to those who are proposing uh, restraints against oligarchy and a broad middle class. So with that in mind, we've got a dream team of scholars, organizers, and scholar organizers on this panel. I really could not be more excited for this. Um, uh, I'm going to break with tradition from today and like say a tiny bit about each of them uh, so, that, so that they're uh, situated for everyone in the room and those watching at home. And the presentations are going to go in alphabetical order by last name. Uh, so uh, I'll introduce in the order and then go ahead and, and turn it over to our speakers. Um, all the way on the left, Yahai Benkler is a professor at Harvard Law School. Uh, for several decades now, he's been a renowned global scholar on the political economy of information. His more recent work is trying to understand certain underlying dynamics of capitalism and their relationship to law. Uh, Sendrick DePaul is a professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School and a leading scholar on the intersection of antitrust and labor law, uh, currently finishing a book on that topic with Cambridge University Press. Uh, and she also has extensive experience representing workers and civil rights plaintiffs, including as uh, past director of the Worker Rights Litigation Clinic at UCLA Law School. Doreen Warren is the president of Community Change, a national organization that builds the power of low-income people and especially people of color, to fight for a society where everyone can thrive. He's also co-chair of the Economic Security Project, which has been a leading organization pushing for guaranteed income or basic income in the United States. And finally, Felicia Wall is president and CEO of the Roosevelt Institute, uh, which does a number of things, but among other things, it's an economic policy think tank focused on how to build a more progressive political economy. 
Uh, she's also the co-host of a fantastic new podcast called How to Save a Country that I highly recommend. So I'll turn it over to them. Uh, each is going to talk for a bit, and then we'll have some uh, some cross-cutting questions. Uh, Yohai, over to you. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for writing your book um, <clears throat> and giving us an opportunity to talk. Um, I wanted to spend a few minutes on what political economy is, uh, what law and political economy might be, and then connect it to the question of constitutional order. Um, at this particular historical moment, when we encounter the crisis of neoliberal capitalism, the historically specific moment of the last 40 or 50 years, where the core pillars were shrinking the state, liberating the market from all of its, unmooring the market from all of its social and political foundations and allowing it to float globally in a single Davos man idea of being able to capture as much as possible. And ignoring or eliminating the social in Maggie Thatcher's great, uh, there is no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women uh, and their families. And the core project as I see it of reviving a conception of political economy is to understand that that is not only a politically unattractive agenda, it is an intellectually incoherent and empirically false description of the state of the world. But programmatically, responding to the crisis of neoliberalism requires us to essentially reverse those fundamental uh, things. We need to embed the market in democratically governed institutions and social relations. We need to revive an understanding and harnessing the state to do so. But we need to not replicate the naive high modernist belief in the effectiveness of expertise by counterbalancing the power of the state with the power of the social and constructing more of a balance of power than an idea of an ideal individual. Realistically, not realistically, conceptually, what we need is to find a way to reduce market imperative, essentially to shrink market reach overall in our lives, which means some core commitment to partial decommodification of basic needs uh, and some core commitment to partial decommodification of labor, whether it's through uh, universal basic income, whether it's through uh, a jobs guarantee. And we need to understand how that connects directly with um, uh, an effort to uh, systematically oppose the uh, racialization of class relations uh, and the gendering of class relations. Um, and, and in that regard, if you remember this morning, uh, uh, Bertrand Ross raised uh, the, um, um, uh, the freedom budget as a model, the idea that we reconstruct the concept of an integrated march, march for jobs and freedom, not one or the other, but the combination. So an active, uh, active fight against status subordination in social relations of production, as well as continuing and not giving up in social relations of uh, 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 status subordination in relations of meaning and reproduction. We need to restructure power in the economy focused on uh, uh, late power, particularly of labor, rebuild state capacity again with a sufficiently, a suitably skeptical and robust uh, uh, model of, of countering state capture. Uh, and we need to find a way to socially embed production, create new forms of production that play not everything. You can't have a fully cooperative economy. You can't have a fully commons-based co-op uh, economy, but we need a sustained public commitment to increasing the portion of the economy that functions on a social basis. So that's a, a set of goals. And we face a particular problem in achieving it, which has two components. One is the McConnell court, uh, the outcome of, of Machtpolitik at a level. I have to say, it's remarkable to sit here in the prior panel and realize what 40 years of Machtpolitik and political appointments will do as a panel sits here and completely without question 
puts position that 40 years ago in critical legal studies were way out there and led uh, liberals like Owen Fisk to say, these are nihilists. No, the reality turns out to be that's just the way things are. <laughs> um, and the other, of course, is the Senate, which was also raised in, in the prior uh, question. And the question to me in this regard, and, and, and Joey and Willie really focus us on the way in which we talk about um, uh, constitution and commitment and duties. And I wanna try to have us focus on where the power is. Mm -hmm. And let me just, a couple of things. So, so 13 states plus Washington DC in which Biden won over 57%. About 130 million people, or about 39% of the population, $11.3 trillion of GDP per year, about 45% of US annual GDP, 6.2 trillion in consumer spending, about 43% of US consumer spending, 26 senators. 18 states that Trump got 56 or more, 17.3% of the population, 3.3% of consumer expenditure, 36 senators the power of the states, not for forever, but we're looking at a McConnell court closure for 30 to 40 years now. We're looking at a Senate that is fundamentally dysfunctional barring some major um, um, uh, reform called um, um, getting rid of the filibuster and even then it goes back. So to me, the structural constitutional question is how much can we do with a coalition of progressive states working in a much more self-conscious, much more closely coordinated fashion to leverage the enormous economic power of these states to shape the political economy, in particular, the economy of the United States. The easiest, hard but easiest and constitutionally least problematic is to deploy the, this coordination to achieve industrial policy. Uh, and in this regard, we see the California role in the CAFE standards. We see the agreement with the car manufacturers. Uh, we see uh, the regional greenhouse gas initiative that really made the first push. Uh, Offshore wind is regional. If you have a coalition of California and the West Coast states, of New York, New Jersey, and New England, of Illinois, creating a set of standards, licensing conditions, approval conditions, and uh, incentives, that's a massive source of power. Much more problematic um, is setting high standards uh, uh, towards a more egalitarian political economy for the roughly half of the population that lives in these states. We appropriately, I think, think of the federal system because of all of the people who will be left outside of reasonably social democratic arrangements. But what about the half of people who might actually go there earlier? And again, there were references earlier to the 19th century, the first public utility laws, we could also add in the first blue sky laws before uh, 32. Uh, we can talk about women's suffrage starting in the States long before it came to the federal. Uh, partly it's about direct reaching decent lives for 150 million people. And partly it's about setting standards, particularly when you have the, the need to, um, uh, for companies that operate around the nation to align themselves with where a majority of their consumers um, uh, is. So more aggressive state antitrust law enforcement, for example, is another place. We can think of it, um, um, and again, here we see in the other direction, we see Alec um, uh, doing it in the other direction uh, across multiple states. There's no reason to leave those victories on the table. Um, <clears throat> much more of a robust, um, um, of a robust reach is to take what, what Anu Bradford calls the Brussels effect in regulating online media. That is to say, the EU is the only economic power large enough and functional enough to actually impose regulation 
on social media, and that spills over to the rest of the world, there's no reason not to leverage that approach within American economic, within American political economy. Here, the difficulty is dormant commerce clause, what you can do, what you can't do, how you fight, you're operating against um, active uh, resistance from the six apparatchiks. It's, that's how it's going to work. But nonetheless, the battle needs uh, uh, to be there. Um, so one option would be something using like the national popular uh, vote model where any state can start passing it, but it'll only kick in when enough states with enough consuming power join in. So California and New York can do it alone, but Vermont can show the way without actually getting cut out. How to do it will be uh, much more. And finally, let me just close with what really is probably unlikely. Uh, no, that's much too uh, impossible. Um, and that's actually passing laws that require fighting over the fiscal capacity of the states and trying to pull back some fiscal capacity from the federal system back into the states. If we're, if we're imagining a universe in which when things really work, we need universal health care, we need um, um, uh, cradle to grave education staffed by unionized public employees, we need uh, uh, universal housing at a different level, we need to let we, we need some form of active labor market policies or a jobs guarantee of some form. These are all things that don't that it's not enough to just do regulation. We need fiscal capacity. That's harder. It's more ambiguous, as 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 Brand's work has uh, as shown in terms of how it's used in the opposite direction. But uh, uh, the core question to my mind is, where is the power, and how do we leverage? We talk about the power of economics over politics. How do we leverage that power intentionally? That to me is a structural constitutional question. Sanjita. Thank you. So I want to pick up on um, three strands that I heard in earlier um, talks today. Uh, one is from uh, Willie and Joey's project. Um, and, you know, so front and center, I think, in their project is this idea that uh, the ascendancy and now hegemony of this science, you know, putatively scientific technocratic discipline of economics has, uh, you know, uh, displaced this broader conception of political economy. Um, and so I what I want to do is take that piece up and, and urge us to contest this at its roots and that we, as uh, many of us as lawyers, should be involved in this. It's, we shouldn't just be ceding this to a fight between economists elsewhere. Another theme um, that, that I think, uh, that, that I hope is served by what I'm going to say, uh, Sabil spoke about, uh, and others spoke about this too, but that movements uh, on the ground are already happening. And the question is, uh, I, I think he said, you know, what will it take for their demands to have force? And I think that that is the, our role in this, you know, in, in this, uh, uh, whatever the mechanism of change is going to be, it's going to involve lawyering, it's going to involve organizing on the ground. And then it involves ideas change, I think, too, in the legal and economic sphere. But I see, uh, you know, at least my role, our role, uh, as clearing the space for those good ideas that are already there in, uh, among the movements on the ground, I think. Uh, and, and so th that that is a big piece of it and leads into finally, the third point I heard Professor Ross say um, that the, con the conservative movement was pretty good about being non, so, so I don't want to give them too much credit, but but in certain ways, non elitist involving the populace, the Tea Party. That, so we need to do this too, right? I mean, we we and uh, we need to do it um, at, at, at certainly at the level of movements on the ground, but we also also need to do it at the level of legal and economic ideas. We need to not assume that the best ideas are just in the places that the current system has anointed to be um, the top of the pyramid. Why would we think that would be the case? And I think that that's true in economics in particular, and we should be looking at a wider variety of economists, um, and these are going to involve people at marginalized, under-resourced uh, departments in many cases. Okay, so with that, I'm going to very um, unambitiously in my 
my remaining time, try to talk about a chapter fragment um, that uh, John Maynard Keynes wrote that I think is a really good vehicle to kind of get at one real problem with this scientific technocratic um, uh, a conception of economic theory. Okay, so in this chapter fragment, which was uh, an early piece of what became the general theory, Keynes explicated certain aspects of, quote, the classical theory as exemplified in the tradition from Ricardo to Marshall, unquote. More than just preparatory to his discussion of economy-wide conditions and dynamics, which is how we think of Keynes now, his argument goes to the basic suppositions of the classical and neoclassical theory of markets. In fact, the argument goes to the question whether, as the classical theory, which I'm just going to use to refer to both classical and neoclassical economics, um, it, it goes to the question of whether, uh, as the classical theory generally claims, we can ex whether we can expect that markets in the ordinary course will produce, and I quote him, the volume of output which will yield the maximum value of product in excess of real cost. This is, I emphasize this, this is the central conceit of the claim to scientific technocracy, isn't it? The, the, the central conceit of, uh, of the claim to this monopoly on the theoretical framework from, for discussing anything to do with economic policy. And we have to deal with this on its own terms because th this is basically a conception of technical efficiency that, you know, other, other you know, sort of unconstrained by government action that markets are going to produce technically efficient outcomes. There are multiple problems with this. You know, many people um, have, have pointed out that there's government action all the time. You know, there is, of course, right? But also, even if we put some of those things aside, there are real problems with this. Okay, so Keynes concludes that we cannot expect, uh, expect this to occur. Why? The reason is that not, is not that real world markets contain various discrete frictions, distortions, or imperfections, but that the fundamental character of our monetary economy, as he called it, directly undermines the basis for the expectation of efficient outcomes. He explains that while in a, the simple case of his terms are kind of confusing. He called it a cooperative economy, but really just an economy in which there's no exchange is, is really what he's talking about. Household production, but it can be really big household production too. Um, he explains that in this simple case, uh, th that we can expect this type of real efficiency in the sense that only, I love this phrase, quote, miscalculation or stupid obstinacy can stand in the way of production. Another way of saying technically efficient outcomes. Uh, in other words, whose expected real yield exceeds, exceeds its expected real cost efficiency, a kind of efficiency that maybe we can all sort of agree on, right? I mean, th th we don't want to waste things in an era of climate change, and right? So that, that is something that we maybe actually want to take on. And, and, and I think we need to take on the idea that, th that this is what's going to happen unconstrained by market uh, by by government action right or or labor coordination or other forms of coordination in the market um okay so to see why this would be the case, we have to first consider why we would expect this alignment of motivations and efficient production to occur in the simple case. In the, in the first place, Keynes, um, so as I mentioned, Keynes's cooperative economy is actually household production where the production unit corresponds to the consumption unit. Or in other words, the production unit um, consumes only everything it produces. In this simple case, the unit will undertake production as long as it values the yield more than it values whatever the cost of expending the effort is, right? Um, and, uh, and so we can just grant them this, that this would be true in this case. Keynes further generalizes this from the simple case because um, even in cases of barter or money payment, this is still consistent with the expected outcome as long as each factor of production receives a value that's equivalent to his or her share of the directly produced output, which is going to be mediated by some type of agreement. So the, I mean, the, you got to put aside that the agreement might be unfair or there might be power. This is the thing. This is the, an argument that goes beyond just market power. All right. So the problem, Keynes suggests, is that this scenario is only a limiting case. It is frequently true in reality, he says, that the volume of, a volume of employment, the marginal disutility of which is equal to the utility of its marginal product, is unprofitable in terms of money. In short, money profit diverges from technical efficiencies, while action predicated directly upon the existence, um, defined in subjective utility terms, while action predicated direct, uh, sorry, <laughs> got a little ahead of myself there, um, that the, the action predicated directly upon the existence or non-existence of technical efficiency does not. Okay, um, 
I just want to put a finer point on this. The nub of the issue for Keynes driving this divergence between profitability and technical efficiency is not complexity of production in general, nor is it actually money, but it's economic activity mediated by exchange. That's the issue that we can't expect, you know, whatever is that these technical efficiencies that we can expect because people are rational at the level of where production and consumption are sort of united. We can't expect that to, to sort of transmit itself through relations of exchange. That is the fundamental problem. I'm going to, have to skip over in order to stay on time um, some of what I would have said to elaborate on that. Um, sorry. <laughs> so actually, I'm, I'm going to elaborate a tiny bit. So the problem is that the moment you introduce exchange, there's no way to ensure that each factor of production receives a money payment equivalent to the share of output that he or she would have received in that unified production unit governed by agreement. Um, and so there's just no reason to expect this convergence between incentives and technical efficiencies, at least as long as we're measuring the latter um, only in terms of uh, subjective utilities as the classical theory generally does uh and and the moment we ex we introduce this exchange of outputs the uh that alignment goes away um and so I think this argument, I'm happy to talk about that in a little more detail. I skipped over some of the details, but I think this argument is both powerful and important. It goes to the heart of the classical theory, which largely forms the most convincing basis of the common sense commitment to free markets that so many reformers and activists are wrestling with today on whatever level, whether they're trying to make policy or do direct organizing, or whether they're dealing with how some of these quote, free market arguments have been uploaded into big C constitutional law, whether that's the dormant commerce clause or whether it's uh, other, other, maybe not technically constitutional arguments, but federal preemption, whether it's sectoral regulation, federal preemption under antitrust, whatever it may be. Um, you know, this, this is the heart of the point. And this it's it's also worth putting aside for the moment the issue of what's beautiful about this argument. It, it puts aside the issue of unfair initial conditions, right? And uh, it's such a which is such a common point of criticism of market ideology, both in the more technical debates and in broader po public and political discourse, discourse. And instead, the argument considers what ha um, happens, sort of you, you know, even if the picture is working as well as it possibly could. And I think a way of translating what he's saying in more technical terms is that everything unfair about the economy need not be traced back to unfair initial conditions. Instead, the inherent interruptibility, as the argument shows, of this correspondence between incentives and efficiency that exists in that very simple unrealistic case, um, you know, simply does not exist in an economy mediated by partially by exchange, which means that there is potential for exploitation, and power perpetuation at almost every turn, right? That, that's the consequence of this argument. He doesn't talk about that, but that is a consequence of this argument. That is on the one hand pessimistic compared to the rosy classical picture, but it simply means that our legal and social planning of markets and economic activity, which separate point is inevitable anyway, is happening all the time, right? That, that our legal and social planning has to counteract these tendencies by channeling both economic coordination and competition in fair egalitarian directions. But it's helpful to eliminate the idea that doing so consciously will ipso facto lead us away from technically efficient outcomes because then we're always playing defense. We're always looking for exceptions. And I think it is worth us doing the deep work to take this on on its own terms um, and and, and there's going to be some organizational work to do that. And I just want to encourage us all to do that. It's a little snapshot. Dorian. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, thank you to Joy and Willie for writing this book. Um, this is my second time reading it. I think I read a draft in 2015, 2016. So thank you. Um, thanks to Breach and Rogers, Georgetown Law, ACS, Hewlett. LPE, all the co-sponsors and others I'm forgetting. Um, so I co-lead actually um, an organization called Community Change. And in that spirit, I wanna pick up where um, Bertrand Ross left off because I wanna talk a lot about organizing and movement work and what it would take to achieve the vision that Julie and Willie so um, eloquently lay out in their book. 
Um, and just say a little bit about us. We work with about 100 grassroots organizations around the country, supporting community organizing around racial, economic, and immigrant justice. I also want to say I'm going to have two hats on, an organizer hat and a political science hat. I suspect my colleague Felicia will also be wearing multiple hats um, as a fellow political scientist. So our host told us that this convening is intended to be more than just an academic symposium. Um, and so I want to stipulate that we're all on board with one exception, Ryan. I want to stipulate we're all on board with Fishkin and Four Best Project. Let's say we all agree that there's an urgent need to break free from our impoverished and ahistorical understanding of the Constitution and revive the democracy of opportunity tradition. But then, if we're all there, what are we supposed to do with the anti-oligarchy Constitution? So Willie and Joy make clear that the book's counter history aims to be more than just a scholarly intervention against the dominance of law and economics in the legal academy. And I think that's an important intervention in its own right. But as this convening makes clear, the co-authors aren't speaking to academics alone. Their book is actually a call to action. It's a rallying cry for progressives for a wide ranging agenda for transformative social and economic change. And yet, and yet, and this is out of love, gentlemen. And yet, despite providing a rich history of how this constitutional vision was achieved in the past, the anti-oligarchy constitution is largely silent on how to get to this vision today. It's silent on something we so desperately need in this existential moment for our democracy, and that's strategy. So I want to say a little bit about strategy. How do we get from here to there? What power building is required by progressives to achieve this constitutional vision? And what are the strategies and mechanisms for achieving it? What work is required to vanquish the well-financed network of actors on the right, advancing neo lochnerian political economy in the courts and legislatures and universities, in the media and civil society? So let's say I'm an organizer and not a legal academic. How am I supposed to organize people? How am I supposed to organize people who experience the, the brutalities of our neo lochnerian political economy every day, who aren't deep in the history retrieved by Willie and Joy, and who may have lost faith in the Constitution as an instrument for justice? These are the questions that appear, in all due respect, to be beyond the scope of the book itself, because no book can do everything, but they are the focus, I think, of our conversation in this panel. So I want to offer some provocations, some thoughts um, about these questions. First, both today's Democratic Party um, and grassroots social movements and third parties, I might add, are essential to achieving the anti-oligarchy constitution. And I want to bring in the role of parties in particular because they are essential to agenda setting and the agenda setting that the co-authors are advocating is at the highest order, right? It's constitutional redesign, not just federal legislation, but social movements set the agenda by putting issues on agendas that wouldn't get there via normal politics. And it's what political scientists simply refer to as the second face of power. So parties, governing power and outside pressure get issues on the agenda in addition to over the finish line. So how should we think about the question of agenda setting? Second, I think the intervention can't begin and end with a call for only more constitutional rhetoric. So I don't understand Willie enjoyed, you know, to be merely telling grassroots organizers to use more constitutional language in our work. The adjustment in language and rhetoric for sure is necessary. I'm going to come back to this point and actually support your argument there in a few minutes. It's necessary, but not sufficient to win change. There are no magic words. I say this, especially in this town of Washington, DC, a lot of rich people, a lot of people get rich with magic messaging strategies that mostly don't work. Um, so I'm very skeptical of any kind of rhetorical arguments on their own. So I wanna ask the question, what else is needed? Is it on the ground organizing? Is it other things to supplement the constitutional argumentation um, to win structural change? Third, in order for progressives to commit to advancing an anti-oligarchy constitution, we collectively need to figure out how to translate that constitutional vision into hard electoral power. The power of broad majorities to make this vision a reality, um, the power of broad majorities in Congress to enact sweeping federal legislation or supermajorities in Congress or the states required to ratify constitutional amendments. So I wanna just put that question on the table. Fourth, I think we need a strategy as well to weaken oligarchic interest. It's not enough 
just to build infrastructure to advance an anti-oligarchy constitution, we actually have to take on the oligarchic interests that are roadblocks and stand in the way. And I'm thinking here about political scientist Jeff, Jeffrey Winter calls the wealth defense industry, that network of lobbyists, lawyers, accountants, consultants, politicians who shield wealth from taxation. That's just one example. Fifth, um, and I wanna also say um, Jeffrey Winters hypothesizes, and I think Willie and Joy agree, that crises present an opportunity to disempower oligarchic interests. So um, Winters says the Great Depression, World War II were two such crises. I think in our current moment, COVID-19 was a more recent one. For sure, there will be more crises emerging, whether it's the continuing climate change crisis or crises of democracy. How should we think about these crises as opportunities to win change? So with these points in mind, I wanna say a few words just about what a strategy might look like. So I'm putting on my organizer's hat and I don't have all the, I don't have all the answers here, but I do know how to design campaigns. But my first question would be, what do we need to make this happen? What are the necessary and sufficient causal factors? What do history and social science tell us about how anti-oligarchic coalitions came together before to win enough power to prevail? So I would point to, and I was struck by, actually by the first panel this morning, that there's a lot of conversation about the second founding moment of Reconstruction. And then there's a lot of conversation about the New Deal. And it is almost like we forgot the 19 teens for structural constitutional change. And that didn't come out of nowhere, came out of both a populist movement and a progressive movement of the late 1890s and early 1900s. I was actually hoping that um, the resident historian of, the, of populism and populist movements, Michael Kazin would say something about this. But I was thinking a lot this morning about the 16th Amendment in 1913, which established federal income tax, the 17th Amendment in 1913, the direct election of senators. Um, yes, there was also um, in 1919, the 18th Amendment around prohibition. And then by 1920, we get the 19th Amendment of women's suffrage. How did those come about? What's the theory of change that produced those outcomes? And how do we learn from those mm -hmm. historical episodes in this moment? And in that light, I was thinking a lot about state power. And frankly, I think this is similar to an argument you were making, Professor Benkler, about progressive federalism. And in fact, Jamel Bowie in his column in the New York Times this morning makes a very similar argument. Can we think about states and state constitutions as um, I think as Justice Brandeis said, laboratories of democracy that helped us to scale up or stepping stones to the broader vision that Joey and Willie illustrate? Um, one quick example that I'm very proud of because um, we supported grassroots organizing on the ground. If you didn't hear, I missed all the results of the recent midterm elections in the state of New Mexico. There's a constitutional amendment passed guaranteeing access to early education and child care with a funding mechanism in perpetuity, $150 million a year to fund that effort. Whoa, that's a huge, huge advance and an expression in fact of the anti-oligarchic vision in some ways um, that you present. Or my, how might we think about, um, because you, you did mention guaranteed income, um, there are currently now 100 pilots around guaranteed income across the country, which is pretty astounding to me. But how might we think about state power and state constitutional um, plays around guaranteeing income or jobs, frankly? So it's a question around state power and political strategy. Two last points. Um, I, my very first campaign, I'm from Chicago. My very first campaign um, that I volunteered on was in 1995. It was a special election. It was very cold in Chicago. It was December, 1995. And um, I felt very proud about helping to elect this young man named Jesse Jackson Jr. to Congress. And he's kind of been, now, like I said, I'm from Chicago and Chicago politics, Chicago politics. So unfortunately, um, he did serve jail time. But before that um, low moment in his life and career, in every, in every Congress, he introduced constitutional amendments. In every single Congress, constitutional amendment around health care, around voting rights, around education, around reproductive rights, around housing, around uh, climate change and environment. So I want us a little bit to reclaim that tradition. Um, because I think that is a model that uh, not enough people 
um, were aware of, much less signed up for in the 90s and early 2000s. Last point, um, how do we think about the role of oligarchy in our politics right now, given rising authoritarianism and white nationalism? And through no fault of their own, the book is a bit silent on this point, um, but Willie and Joey do remind us that historically oligarchy and authoritarianism have rested pretty comfortably with each other. So I think a lot about the Jim Crow South um, as our version, our homegrown indigenous version of racial oligarchy and racial authoritarianism, especially if you think of the period starting with Plessy until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So we have a long period of racial authoritarianism and racial oligarchy in Southern states. How do we think about, how do we think about what it took to overcome that long period? And frankly, I'm really worried about what I would call the issue or the problem or the challenge of rainbow oligarchy as we look towards the future. So inclusion is not enough. Inclusion is not enough. I worry about um, faces that look like mine advancing oligarchic interest. And for us as political strategists being really confused. Now we have some examples. I would just look to a couple states in the South right now. I'm not gonna say anything more about that, but we have to be really careful and really, really um, strategic and ensuring in terms of the democracy of opportunity um, tradition, that inclusion is tied to accountability and especially around oligarchic and corporate interest so that we don't end up in a situation of rainbow oligarchy. So with that, I'll close and thank you again, Brishan. Alicia. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and thanks everybody. It's very nice to be here. Um, it's also nice to be the absolute last speaker uh, in a very long day. Um, but thanks to Brishan, thanks to ACS, LPE, uh, Georgetown Law um, and the Hewlett Foundation. Um, and of course to uh, Fishkin and Torboth for writing this book. You know, I. We still haven't met because I came in late today, but I have been a big fan of your work for a very long time. I was going through my Google Docs and realizing that I had notes on some of your early work from 2016, 2017, 2018. So that was that was fun to pull up as I prepared for this. Um, but at any rate, one of the things I really liked about all of these presentations um, is the way in which Yochai and Sanjuta and Dorian all centered this question of power, 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 power. <laughs> Um, in shaping our political economy and in shaping the kind of constitution that um, we are going to need to make the current political economy better. Um, so I'm not a lawyer, by the way, so I'm not going to try. I have a lot of constitutional questions, um, but I'm going to try to tee this up as somebody who thinks about and works on questions of political economy. Uh, because I believe that the vision that you put out in your book, this vision of progressive, affirmative, very bold, uh, very imaginative uses of the Constitution is absolutely needed today to make sure that any political momentum progressives have had on economic issues uh, is able to be maintained so that we can stay on our front foot. And that's for a couple reasons. Um, I'll give, I'll give, it's really just two reasons. You're supposed to give three because people think in threes, but I really just have two with a subset of examples. Um, the first reason we need this kind of assertive, aggressive, progressive view of our constitution is because of the new economics itself. The new economics, which you have seen in the legislation that has truly miraculously been passed over the last year or two, the new economics is actually really new. And that's something that we have to understand when we think about constitutional supports and protections for um, the outcomes we seek, the equity that we seek. Um, so how is the new economics new? Well, first of all, it is not really just distributional, as important as that is. It is not just turning up or down the dials on tax rates, as important as that is, right? The new economics, when you look at the Chips and Science Act, when you look at the climate portions of the Inflation Reduction Act, when you look at, oh, excuse me, all of the infrastructure um, provisions in the infrastructure law, this is a very, very, very physical manifestation of the new economics. This is about getting money to actual places in this country. 
um, building things in actual geographies. It's also, the new economics is also reparative, right? It is about recognizing the harm of the past and trying to undo it. It is not just about, oh, going forward, you'll get more or less. It is actually about, this is what student debt was about, right? You were, you suffered under an extractive system that did not, for systematic reasons, did not yield the promise that it was supposed to. You graduated with you did not graduate, you had debt and no degree because you were part of a system that did not work. And so we are going to recognize that and forgive your past debt, right? So it is reparative, new economics is reparative. It's also, and this is the part that I think is most important for uh, these questions of constitutional law, it is whole of government, right? It uses many levers of government, many agencies of government to shape and design markets, to try to point towards certain outcomes, and to try to encourage democratic small d decision making. I read the C3 thing, uh, democratic decision making in our economies. So it is about encouraging participation from labor unions, participation from new, uh, from communities. That's what the EJ40 part of some of the new climate uh, legislation is really all about, right? People in communities are supposed to receive money if they are affected and also be part of the planning for what their community is supposed to look like. So the fact that this new economics which is not just in the Treasury Department anymore and not just in the National Economic uh, Council anymore, although it is in those places. It's also being carried out by every federal agency, right? By EPA, by energy, by, um, by commerce. The fact that it is whole of government, that it is physical, that it is reparative, that it also, of course, includes a lot of taxation, which I'm happy to talk about and which I'm actually very excited about. But all of this means that the new economics is way more complicated than neoliberalism, or at least way more complicated than the libertarian parts, because I think neoliberalism as a as a construct is, as Yochai said, incredibly complicated for social reasons. But economically, neoliberalism, libertarian, the libertarian parts of it are fairly simple. But the new economics is very, very, very complicated because it recognizes and it centers government, mm -hmm. right? Government as the most powerful regulator, as the most powerful watchdog, as the largest employer in our country, as the single biggest purchaser in the United States. The new economics says we're supposed to use, I, I, I'm from the Roosevelt Institute, card-carrying FDR uh, fan uh, and amplifier, critic too. But um, but anyway, all to say that like the idea, this new economics uses every part of government, which makes it potentially, potentially very powerful. But it also means given where this court has gone, I'm thinking of, you know, the West Virginia EPA case, I'm thinking of the major questions doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, it means that all of these pieces of the new economics are incredibly vulnerable to attack by this court without a real rethinking of jurisprudence. So um, just a couple of specific examples of uh, the ways in which the new economics is really new. And then I'll talk a little bit about why I think race is a very, very, very important and maybe a special case requiring both rethinking jurisprudentially and probably special kinds of protection. But just a few examples for where the new economics is so amazingly different than anything I would have thought was even possible just a few years ago. Look, just take the Chips and Science Act, right? Um, $52 billion in direct spending out of the Department of Commerce that is supposed to create you know, up to 20 regional hubs where we're going to build, set, reshore semiconductor manufacturing in this country. Now, you can have an argument about whether you think that's a good idea or a bad idea, or whether you're worried about all the money is going to go to a few, uh, you know, very large uh, semiconductor firms. And that is a very real and very reasonable and, and very important concern. But what's remarkable about this is that you basically have direct spending from a federal agency um, that is, that's going to go to places in this country. Um, so that is just one example. Another example, right? 
Um, I don't know how many of you spent a lot of time reading all the supply chain reviews that came out a year ago out of all the federal agencies, but like these were totally incredible. And all of the departments were asked, what can you do to be more active in the shaping of the market or the sectors that you're involved in? So just the Department of Energy, just the Department of Energy, you know, it is supposed to come up with plans to um, create a new domestic mining industry that is supposed to meet environmental justice standards. That's pretty a pretty incredible thing for this Department of Energy to say it's going to do directly. It is supposed to create a dozen different markets that will be publicly backstopped in creating technologies, everything from offshore wind to high powered magnets. I mean, I could go on, but the, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of supply chain review that were much more direct government hmm. um, action to try to shape our economy. Um, and then, of course, all of this is going to be geographically targeted, some of it by design. Again, the CHIPS Act is supposed to actually name 20 different places in this country that are going to get this money. Some of the geographic targeting will be a little bit more diffuse in that, of, like if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, the all of the uh, green manufacturing money and the clean energy money and the wind turbine money, all of that is going to be uh, distributed through tax credits, which means there won't be as much targeting. I personally am arguing for more targeting of that money because you have to actually know where you're going. You have to actually know what you want particular places in this country to look like. Um, if you would like to have thriving in places that have been geographically, uh, that have suffered geographically. But at any rate, the point of raising this is that, you know, given where this court has ruled, basically all of the new economics gives this this is a very target rich environment for this new court or for the jurisprudence that we're seeing that comes out of this court. And so I, uh, hmm. I, it's sort of like a race between what the government, which seems to have found some, some kind of backbone again, right? It's a race between what the government is able to do and what the court is going to say it cannot do. And I worry about this tremendously for this very uh, nascent kind of new way of shaping our economy. Um, so then the last thing I'll say here has to do with race equity in particular, because one of the things about that I find remarkable about this administration's approach to not just economics, but to race equity is that from the very beginning of this administration, and I, I, I truly am saying this, uh, I'm trying to say it analytically um, and not as a sort of cheerleader or a, or a critic, um, but just analytically, the whole of government approach that you that this administration took to race equity, you know, January 2021, the Biden um, EO, the Biden Executive Order on Race Equity, was really bold, right? It really said government is going to use all those powers that I just named: regulator, watchdog, employee, purchaser, deliberately to drive race equity. Um, and we have seen lots of places in which this government has done that, right? Raising the minimum wage for all federal contractors to 15 an hour, or the, the proposal to do that. Um, the Federal Trade Commission has argued that antitrust reform should prioritize fighting uh, concentration in industries where people of color are most specifically harmed, data privacy, et cetera. And then I already mentioned student debt cancellation, which is a really interesting case as a reparative policy that had particularly um, disproportionately benefited um, students of color, borrowers of color. Of course, that's for real reasons having to do with when communities of color, when black and brown families have less wealth because they they have had very little opportunity to earn wealth because of redlining and because of a whole host of labor and other policies, then those communities have to borrow more in order to go to school. Um, so uh, student debt is of course a policy that disproportionately affects positively communities of color. So. Many of these policies um, are either directly or indirectly intended to um, support race equity. But again, of course, that brings up the courts, right? 
because we talked about affirmative action in one of the last sessions. I am very worried about where this court is going to rule on affirmative action going forward. I think that writing is certainly on the wall, um, but you, you've you seen uh, challenges to student debt, not necessarily on race conscious grounds, but on many other kinds of grounds of standing. Um, and then, of course, I think about the Black Farmers case. I don't know how many of you have been following this, but you know, the Black farmers relief efforts that were in the American Rescue Plan in 2021, um, those were challenged in court expressly by white farmers backed by right-wing interests um, on race discrimination grounds. And then, of course, the administration backed off of that. And now the administration is being sued by a host of Black farmers because they did not uh, stand up to their promises. At any rate, the point here is that this is, of all of the challenges to a muscular government approach to managing the economy, of all of the constitutional challenges or legal challenges, this one to me is the biggest challenge, right? And you all wrote uh, several years ago um, the following. Um, we must reforge the link between racial justice and political economy, widening the constitutional lens through which we see questions of race beyond anti-discrimination laws, beyond voting rights, to include substantive issues of mass incarceration, health care, public investment, job creation, and wealth inequality. And to me, as a non-lawyer, I have to ask, why isn't this, why isn't this vision of race equity, why isn't this a 14th Amendment question, right? Why isn't greater racial equity part of, central to, a compelling state interest, especially when all of these race in, racial inequities can be traced to past laws that, that are governmental? So I ask this as a question to all the lawyers in the room, but it just does seem to me that a race forward jurisprudence and a strategy to get to like every constitutional lawyer I meet, I always ask, so like, what are the 10 cases you would have to try to like get to a more race conscious, race forward jurisprudence? And either I'm asking the wrong question or we haven't collectively thought about it enough, but I, I haven't heard an answer that makes a lot of sense to me, but I, and maybe, I, I'm probably not asking the right people, but I do think that finding this or, and getting to this is critically important if we are to live up to the promise of um, both the race equity efforts that we are seeing in fledgling ways um, in this administration. And then also, of course, these larger questions uh, or these other questions of um, the new economics um, and using a whole of government approach to actually manage our political economy better. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That was so great. Um, I, I thought I would pose uh, to the group kind of two cross-cutting questions. And Felicia, you actually anticipated uh, one of my questions in, in a few ways. Um, it, it, and this is also by way of drawing out some of the kind of commonalities among the group, but also trying to push you know, forward uh, with some of the issues that, that have been raised. So the first is about... Um, you know, neoliberalism in part, but more about democracy. So, you know, part of what a number of people, uh, you know, on the panel, a number of people in the room, to some extent, you know, I, I, I think Fishkin and Forbath uh, are thinking about is how we construct a, a new mode of jurisprudence, a new sort of theory of governance that can, uh, that can take the place that uh, neoliberalism or something like it uh, took in our politics uh, and even our jurisprudence and our public culture uh, for the last couple of decades. Um, and I don't wanna get into definitions of neoliberalism. What I do wanna say uh, is, you know, by way a little bit of, maybe by provocation, you know, there's a line of argument in left legal circles right now that what we should be thinking about is democracy as an alternative to neoliberalism. Um, often as a normative ideal that we can hold up as an alternative to, you know, the putative market principles that kind of dominated uh, marked politic, as, as Yochai said. But of course, democracy is a very complex and fraught practice and notion, right? There's, just to state the obvious, there's the tension between majoritarianism and the rights of minority and subordinate groups. Mm -hmm. There's the contradiction between the United States vision of itself as a democracy and the fact that we were not a democracy until at least 1964. Um, and then we were for a short period, right? You know, are we now? Um, 
And that's the fact that our economy is profoundly undemocratic. Uh, in the sense that firms and financial actors uh, tend to control production choices with little mind for you know, social needs, workers' needs, and the like. So, okay, the first question slash provocation is, is democracy a good place to start these conversations? And if so, how do we think about democracy uh, in our economy and society today? How does it inform your work? Uh, how can we use it for purposes of organizing, for rethinking jurisprudential questions and the like? The second question I have, um, you know, that was written down. The second I've sort of sketched as we, uh, as you we were talking, and so I hope this one um, is coherent, which is that all of you have focused to some extent on, you know, a complex of things you could call material or economic or class-based as a way of thinking about the task ahead of us, right? That that, you know, there has. Obviously, we're in an age of spiraling economic inequality. We have to begin addressing these questions. Um, we've all been working on these questions. Um, and I guess the question I want to pose is, it, it, you know, without putting it in the class box, without putting it in the material box, I do think, you know, I think everyone here is going to agree. If we're going to combat systemic inequality and, and make a construct a political economy that is more open, more equal, <laughs> what's the coalition that's going to drive toward that? Right. So Dorian put this on the table to an extent. I want to push on it. Um, so, you know, as a first point, you know, I, I, I'm kind of of the school of thought that thinks you have to have a coalition to get any major political changes through. Um, whether that's elements of the New Deal actually, you know, being beneficial to capital in the medium term or long term, uh, or the whole welfare states literature that points out the way in which cross-class coalitions have shaped uh, the, the, the generosity and the structure of welfare states in many, many ways. So I wanted to kind of think of this along a couple different lines, uh, and I'll, I'll sketch those and then turn it over to whoever would like to pick this up. One, of course, is, is along the lines of race, right? We have a huge division in terms of political belief and political behavior now uh, between white and non-white citizens in the country. Um, there's a gender divide, of course. Um, now, one suggestion, at least on the, on the, uh, in terms of the racial division, has been to put in place universal benefits that can end up you know, capturing uh, majority support to general decommodification benefits. So is that a strategy we can take up? Here's another. Can we form a coalition between the working class, you know, a multiracial working class, uh, and the middle class? What are the things that? What are the the particular policies and the strategies that might be able to gain uh, gain um, allegiance from both of those groups? Mm -hmm. But then to make it more complicated, this is one of the places where Felicia went. There's an urban-rural divide in the country, right? And you know, rural areas end up experiencing issues like corporate power rather differently from how urban areas do. Uh, they obviously experience uh, you know, concentration in the agricultural sector, uh, the loss of jobs uh, in different ways than, than urban areas do. And then finally, maybe one of the most important divides in terms of voting behavior is age. So you know, uh, younger voters obviously very much committed to uh, a green transition, a just transition, very committed to forgiveness of student debt. Um, older generations much less so. So you know, the difficult question: What is the coalition that one can put together? What are the elements of the coalition one can put together? And to come back to my earlier conversation, what's the earlier question? You know, what's the vision that can do so? Is it democracy? Is it something else? How are you thinking about that? Can I ask a question about your question? Uh, sure. You, like coalition to what end? Coalition to actually revive and or further a more robust progressive constitutional tradition or to mm. like a more partisan call? Like what yeah. co coalition for what? Coalition to rebuild the political economy or to build the political economy that we want, right? And, you know, I, I table for the moment the question of whether that's carried out in kind of foreground constitutionalist terms or whether it, it's carried out simply through you know uh, ordinary yeah. politics that's what that's what I'm, I'm driving right. at right I, again and part of the reason for this is that as we keep coming back to today the court is such an impediment that there's going to have to be a political solution uh to the court, to the court. yeah of course um and so what's that coalition mm -hmm. how do the policy and the politics fit together dorian you want to start no <laughs> Look, can I question, can I ask clarification? Sure, you're not even law professors. Because um, your first question is, is democracy the best way to think about these questions? Democracy as opposed to what? 
yeah. Sub maybe substantive criteria. Democracy so as opposed to like material. Democracy as opposed to e uh, economic equality. Yeah. Right. Democracy as opposed to market governance. Democracy as opposed to technocratic management. Democracy as opposed to, you know, what have you. The, you know, the, the rainbow oligarchy that you proposed at the end of your comments. That doesn't strike me as very democratic. <laughs> Sanjukta? So, I mean, I can take a stab. Um, so, I mean, I feel, I, I think this is a really important question. Um, uh, and I, I think, you know, so coming back to the, the sort of free market trope, I mean, it's, I think it's important to acknowledge that for people who believe that ideology or, you know, are convinced by it, the sort of putatively uncoordinated market exchange was supposed to itself be a replacement for, or at best, an implementation of democracy, right? Like that's what people believe. So it's important to confront that on its mm -hmm. own terms, I think. Um, and I think that it's supposed, it's supposed to be, you know, implementation of democracy and also at the same time, be welfare maximizing and efficient, right? So the, the argument that I was talking about goes to the uh, efficient and welfare maximization point. Um, I think as well, it goes to the, uh, to the democracy point because, um, because again, there's these opportunities for power perpetuation at, at all of these junctures. Um, and so, I, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a grand answer, but I agree with, I think the intuition behind the question that, that we have to come up with a substantive alternative. I don't think that that substantive alternative, it has to be a theory on the terms of the theory that we're trying to displace. Um, but I think it does need to provide us with criteria other than just democracy, although democracy is important for governing the economy. And, and, so, and so I think on that last part of, of um, I, I think market governance is just what we do anyway, right? So democratic market governance is one way to do it, but we need, but, but we need other criteria. I think egalitarian, you know, substantively egalitarian outcomes is one of them. Part, you know, democracy. Uh, once you put aside the idea that this magical uncoordinated exchange, which is, of course is not uncoordinated, but even if it, you know, even if you take the sort of conventional forms of coordination for granted, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's not democratic. It's not producing efficient outcomes. Once we sort of throw that out the window, then what do we do other than conscious coordination. And what can we do besides design that in, I mean, right? I mean, so once you have conscious coordination, there's immediately space for democracy. So I'm going to say that as a plug for doing what I said, of, you know, right? Like, because, because this is an end run around that, like, so, so I mean, said the point, I could say it two more times other ways, but right. I mean, so immediately, so then we do have to, of course, do the work of institution building. Like what is, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, yeah. labor unions, yeah. but, of, yeah. but you know, other, uh, other forms of local, um, regional, national uh, governance of the economy that is going to have, I mean, I think Yokai said that, that deploys state power, but has input for, you know, uh, it, it just the state doing stuff is not enough there. Mm -hmm. It has to be broadly inclusive. Um, and, and so I, I don't have a magic answer to that, but I do tend in the direction of, of incorporating devolved, you know, I don't know if everyone here would agree and that's fine. Anyway, I think that's one of the conversations we have to have. I and mean, I sort of think I, uh, localism is important. It's not going to be the answer for everything, but I think that we can come up with uh, good federal local partnerships where we are, um, it, which includes rural areas, which, right, so so I think that this has to be part of the conversation. Um, also, I'll just quickly mention this, though, as part of what, because of, uh, as part of this reclaiming efficiency idea, because I don't think that efficiency is bad. I think that's one of the reasons it's important to meet these arguments on their terms, because technical efficiencies are good, not wasting labor effort, not wasting natural resources. These are good things. We need to reclaim that. So how do we do it? Um, and, and how do we still, you know, how, how one of the great claims uh, in addition to sort of the idea that uncoordinated exchange is ipso facto fair, it um, is welfare maximizing and efficiency enhancing, and it incentivizes innovation. That's another big argument for it, right? So I think one concrete thing that we do have to figure out is how do we have a mix of the right mix of stability and instability in our economic governance systems? Because I think 
that's the appeal of if you want to call it capitalism, right? Like that there's it's so unstable all the time. We all here are pretty lucky and to have pretty stable lives. The, most of the world does not have that. Much of our society does not have that. There's this pervasive lack of stability that people experience in their personal lives, right? And um, and economic security that's done through direct benefits can address that to a great level. But how do we make one way that we make that sustainable is creating these democratic structures where people are directly participating, right? Um, so how do we do that without inviting the arguments that we sh again should take these confront these head on that when you have very, very stable systems that are sort of closed systems in some way that they become exclusive in the wrong ways. If you have a like a, I've been working on this progressive era stuff, a closed shop and it's all white men craft workers like that's not good the teams you know the teamsters all being white men in a regulated industry is also not good um how do you know so that's one element of it but also not doing waste like not having you know i mean th these are real things actually and so so i don't have the magic answer to that i don't think the answer is the market because i think that makes no sense anyway but we have to have an answer and we have to figure out like how to do it i think i don't think that people are i think if one answer is that I think if you treat people like adults, they will behave like adults. Like even in that system, workers weren't given real agency over right. decisions of production, right? I mean, there was some, there was more economic security for some workers, but I don't think that we had the level of agency that we can have and give a, a wider um, set of people. And finally, to answer, uh, and that I think that that might actually address some of the efficiency points is my, was my point. Finally, on the coalition point, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, this is not my expertise. I don't have some deep, you know, insight on this, but I think there were some really good things from the last election. There were broad victories on not just economic justice issues, but on, in, on various types of inclusion that were populist initiatives, you know, um, and that in all in Nevada, in Michigan, where I live, you know, and um, this is really encouraging and optimistic. And again, is we should trust people to, you know, it's not just, it's not just an elite project. And um, I think if we trust people, they're, maybe more likely to step up. And... I'll just jump yeah. in quickly, oh, you're jump in quickly on the democracy question. Um, just a couple of quick reasons why the answer is yes, Grecian. Um, one is, I'm a, so I'm a student of political theorist Ian Shapiro, who argues that democracy is a subordinate foundational good towards justice. Mm -hmm. So the idea is in our campaigns for social justice, um, the preference is to do them democratically. Mm -hmm. It's that simple, right? Um, one. Two, as Professor Paul just said, in this town before the election, all the pundits and consultants were saying, don't talk about democracy. It's not a motivating thing for voters. Pocketbook issues, they were all freaking wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. As it turns out, voters care about democracy. In Michigan, in particular, there were two ballot initiatives that succeeded, reproductive freedom and democracy and voting rights. So I think we have empirical evidence that actually arguments around democracy actually work and motivate people. Um, third, you know, I don't know, it's the best thing we've invented to date in human history, so why give it up now? <laughs> um, fourth, I think Willie and Joey already say in the book that it actually, re their vision requires us to build super majorities to help discipline courts. That's democracy at work. Um, fourth, I would say, when I think of democracy, I think of civil society and social movements and labor movements. And we know empirically it takes labor, labor movements are critical political actors and transitions to democracy. They're also key in democratic erosion and decline. Yep. Um, in terms of the decline of labor movements, there's a strong correlation. Surprise, surprise, you don't get to January 6th without a, like a 40 year decline in the labor movement. You don't get to 2016 without, a, you know what I mean? So democracy is really important for those reasons. And last but not least, I think democracy and how we frame it as well, in terms of ordinary people, it's both gives people a voice around their own lives, but also democracy linked to government and having government function deliver real change in people's lives makes it easier for me to do my job in organizing and mobilizing people around the vision. So there is this interrelationship. Yeah. Um, so that's my answer on the democracy and I'll show it on that. 
I want to come to you in a second. One thing I thought you were going to mention, uh, which you didn't, is this uh, new work by Jake Grumbach and others uh, showing that uh, unionization ends up actually reducing uh, racist attitudes, essentially, among white workers, correct? Um, That the the process of unionization and the act of being a part of a union actually leads to cross-racial solidarity. And that's important for the point you just made about the exclusive elements of the American labor movement in the you know, for a lot of its history, in a multiracial democracy, we need super inclusive labor movements. Yep. And empirically, we also know that if you're a white working class person, urban, rural, suburban, the difference between being in union or not is basically your your racial attitudes, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. To your point about Jake, Grub- Jake Grumbach's work. Yeah. So this, <clears throat> this in many senses follows directly from this last exchange and takes us all the way back to the morning where where Bertrand Ross uh, emphasized this central role of race as a strategy to break up the working class following following Du Bois in Black Reconstruction as kind of the core claim. Um, And so the answer to the coalition is precisely that, right? The answer to the coalition is if the problem is oligarchy, The, the, the major expansion, and it has to be expansion, it can't be instead. Again, the, the, yeah. the history, I think there's enormous appropriate anxiety about reviving class because for so long it was used to suppress mm-hmm. other core dimensions of subordination, particularly race and gender. Yeah. And so, and so, we, this is not uh, uh, 1892. Right. Right. Um, uh, and what does that translate into? So, <clears throat> take the take the one of the things I I, I listed. The, uh, so, take the idea of a program of care from cradle to grave. Mm-hmm by unionized public employees. No program I can think of more directly responds to gender subordination than um, um, making public and general the uh, uh, economy of care, which is by social convention and practice highly unequal along gender lines. Few, if any, programs would have a larger impact on the intersection of race and uh, gender than to have high quality, uh, dignified, well-paid jobs in the care sector, short of a massive transformation, including immigration as the third dimension of historical subordination. Um, So I think programs that attack at the same time class, race, gender, their interactions, put forward precisely this core strategy of of American oligarchy as it's been for so long, of breaking up. Um, I think a second dimension, and here I think Derek Hamilton's work on using uh, wealth as the primary dimension of determining progressivity of various of, of various federal and state programs mm-hmm. has a very strong uh, um, um, interaction with race. And so is highly likely to create uh, uh, both, both modes of uh, um, reparation and modes of uh, uh, egalitarian, uh, um, uh, multiracial coalition. Uh, So that's about finding strategies for coalition that put front and center the ways in which race, gender, and immigration have been stable strategies of American oligarchy to break the possibility of anti-oligarchic coalitions. And that means, and, and the last point that you raise about democracy It really depends on how it's used. Often I find it used as a way of avoiding making a substantive commitment 
to what we mean by equality, what we mean by social justice. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, without mm -hmm. disagreeing with Dorian about the importance of democracy as a as a critical structure for, for a decent life, I do think we need and owe ourselves and owe everybody else a much better worked out conception of what are the foundations of social justice. What does it mean to have a society in which um, um, broad-based economic security is a given? Mm -hmm. In which knowing that tomorrow you're not going to hunger, you're not going to lose a roof over your head, is not a question, but it's a baseline mm -hmm. assumption. Mm -hmm. And there's got to be a substantive vision of human flourishing mm -hmm. behind that mm -hmm. that cannot fall back on a procedural mm -hmm. model yeah. yes. of democracy. Perfect. 100%. Alicia? Oh, well, yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I agree with all of that. I agree with um, the idea that um, democ fundamentally, as you said, uh, Brishan, democracy ought to be the alternative to neoliberalism. I say that in part because I don't think neoliberalism at core was really ever about the economics. I think neoliberalism at core was about the sort of colonizing of marketized thinking, colonizing mm -hmm. all of the social, mm -hmm. colonizing all of the other elements of your life that you might not want to have ruled by the supply and demand curves. And so I think to the degree to which that was actually neoliberalism's strength and its foundation, it just kind of got dressed up in libertarianism, then I think definitely democracy is the right alternative. I'm also not as worried, of course, democracy is going to be fraught, but you know, so is, so is non democracy. So we might as well fight it on sort of democratic small d grounds, as long as what we are fighting um, with and for and towards has three elements. One is the values, uh, the substantive values claim that Yochai was making for um, the democracy we should be fighting toward. The second is some kind of institutions within which democ our democratic deliberations can take place because otherwise we really do just have kind of chaos. Um, so I'm pro-institutionalist for all kinds of reasons, knowing that some institutions are much better than others. Um, and then the third thing is that, um, you know, democracy does need to have some kind of commitment. And I, again, I think this is what you, you said, Yochai, to some kind of material outcomes. Because if people think that democracy is only procedural, but will have actually no impact on, on whether or not they're gonna have a roof over their head or go to bed hungry, like mostly we think that good democracies in rel reasonably um, healthy economic conditions will lead to some kind of material stability um, because that's what people will demand at the most basic level. So democracy can't be seen as as completely divorced from material but if you have those three things why why wouldn't you want to fight for this on democratic small d grounds that was great um we were as you probably noticed from your program supposed to end at uh 4 45 because uh congressman raskin's speech went a little bit long we thought we would kind of you know take this a little bit longer to around five o'clock um, I wanted to open it up and see if there are questions uh, from the floor for the group. So this midterm election continued a trend of state level ballot initiatives passing that are progressive, like the New Mexico example we noted. And in many cases, these have tended to outperform Democratic candidates for office. How can people who want to see progressive goals realized at a national level try to leverage this momentum into a whole of government approach to progressive political economy? Given so, the time constraints, should we maybe get a couple sure. on the table? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, mm. I thought there's no, oh, yeah.
Hi. Uh, so as uh, Professor Rogers alluded to, within the last couple of years especially, there's been a lot of interest across different disciplines in, I think, democracy and work as a subject. So beyond labor unions, um, how concerned should we be that workplaces are spaces where ordinary people are denied voice and decision making? Authority Elizabeth Anderson's uh, wonderful University of Michigan professor, one of the leading people in this realm. So I guess my question is, to what extent is uh, worker autonomy and worker voice a real and important matter for progressive political economy? And if it is important in that sense, um, what are the mechanisms, both in terms of federal policy and especially in state policy, um, what are the policy levers that we can actually do to build worker um, autonomy and, and voice in, in the workplace? Dorian, do you want to? I can, let me take the second sure. one yeah. uh, first, really quickly. Um, another scholar I have a point out is Karen Oren's fine book on called Belated Feudalism. And um, very similar to um, privatized I think, private, private government, government thing. I, I would just say, I mean, the workplace, and Grecian, you should jump in here. Um, it, they're central sites of authoritarian and oligarchic institutions. They're like the heart of actually <laughs> authority. They're the heartbeat of authoritarianism as institutions in this country. And so we have always needed a strategy. Um, and I, I come down the side of uh, how do you organize workers to be transformative, both at the workplace, but also law, right? Like, there's a long running debate. You need the politics first to change labor law to enable worker organizing, or do you invest in worker organizing to try to change the law? Um, it's probably both and. But I do think just to your to your question and point, really, it should be central to our theories of the case in terms of the how, how do we get from here to there in terms of the vision for Willie and Joy? And I think it requires a massive commitment to organizing. And we're frankly, we're in the midst of a union organizing wave. So there's a lot of reason for hope and, and optimism. It's not necessarily being led by traditional institutional unions either, which is also exciting because, frankly, industrial unionism was birthed out of experiments. And um, if we had waited around for American Federation of Labor Craft Unions to invent it, we'd still be waiting. So there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful and optimistic. And worker strength and bargaining power have to be central to achieving the vision. On the first question, I would just say that's probably a question um, I can't answer. It's, it's a question for the Democratic Party, um, why they have such bad candidates. And <laughs> but we but Americans, you know, there is in political science, we've known this for so long, many, many decades now, Americans are philosophically conservative and operationally liberal. So you ask, you ask in any poll, you know, some fundamental principles, they'll a majority will say they're conservative, blah, 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 blah. But then you say, I want you to vote in South Dakota for Medicaid expansion or in Nebraska for $15 minimum wage or in Michigan for reproductive freedom and voting rights. Those issues win all the time. And so the question, I think you're underneath your question is why the gap? Why the gap? And I think that's a question for the Democratic Party that I cannot answer. I will just add that I do think, and maybe it's because I live more on the policy side of politics and the policy than the politics side of politics, but I do think you are seeing more and more um, people in the political realm. Maybe not people who are like comms directors for mm -hmm. for you know for the D trip or whatever, but like you are seeing more and more people in the political realm who actually understand the political power of the actual things in people's lives that they care about. Mm -hmm abortion rights, decarbonization and climate change, um, jobs. I mean, one of the things in this election in particular that many people seem to be surprised about, I wasn't that surprised about, it's like, yes, people were very, very, very worried about inflation. They should have been worried about inflation. Inflation is very hard on many people, on, on all of us. Inflation is obviously very hard on people who are middle income or who are poor, but the fact that this um, election was basically took place in a full employment economy 
was very good for um, candidates who were part of the party that made full employment possible through fiscal spending. The point being that I do think we're in this, we are, we're actually moving to a more substantive time. Hmm. And maybe this is just my glass half full nature, but I feel like we're actually moving to a more substantive time in politics where people are trying to run on a more coherent um, issues oriented, overarching, not just like laundry list of issues, but an overarching worldview um, that is actually more progressive or more, you know, social democratic or whatever you would call it. So I do think there is some hope. And the fact that these ballot initiatives did well is something that political people will learn from. Mm -hmm. That okay. is my hope. I just uh, say on the question of uh, policy levers for worker power, um, there's quite a bit that can be done. Uh, and I, I even before mentioning that, you know, there's a strong argument for prioritizing those, uh, not necessarily over everything else, but over many things, in the sense that organized workers uh, become a political force that can then push for other reforms. Um, so there's a, just a very, very well established relationship in the comparative political economy and welfare states literature between the strength of organized labor uh, and the generosity uh, of welfare states. Um, now at the federal level, there is a big challenge, which is that the NLRA preemption uh, is fairly broad. However, uh, and the court's gonna end up making it worse in various ways soon. Um, but there are you know, various things that states can do in the collective bargaining front. Uh, they obviously they have authority over public sector workers, and that is a larger and larger proportion of the workforce, uh, including you know, the care workers that Yohai uh, has been talking you know, was just talking about as a, a, a kind of anchor reform. Um, interestingly, the NLRA or NLRB has the power to delegate jurisdiction to state level labor relations authorities in certain instances. They've never exercised that power, but the current general counsel has talked about doing so. Um, so we'll see if that ends up going somewhere, but that could you know, be another way to move around preemption. Then at the, the, you know, there's the proactive course. Uh, there's also lots of space for policy experimentation at the state level that does not trigger preemption concerns. So states can raise minimum wages. They can put in place wage boards that can you know, raise wages at the sectoral level and alter other terms and conditions at the sectoral level. Uh, perhaps most importantly, and like uh, oddly under discussed, they can ratchet back employment at will. Um, and by doing that, they could uh, substantially make it, make it substantially easier for workers to unionize uh, because employment at will just stands as a barrier to unionization, a barrier to enforcement of all workplace rights. Employment at will, of course, is the rule that you can be fired for any reason or no reason uh, at any time, as long as you know the, the firing is not itself illegal. That's state law. And so the states can do what they want there. Hmm. Others want to weigh in? Okay. I well, I mentioned my home state of Illinois that also had something on the on the ballot around a constitutional right to collective bargaining. Yeah, mm -hmm. at the state level, and also won. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, this has been fantastic. Can I uh, ask us to give a round of applause to our panelists here? Um, and we're going to wrap up. I just wanted to ask Willie Forbath to come and say a couple quick closing words. I think we're going to stay here very quick. I won't keep you long. I just want to, on, on Joey's behalf and mine, thank this magnificent panel and this magnificent group of speakers and interlocutors for a, a wonderful day. And, uh, you know, we, we, we couldn't hope for a, a better conversation than, than one we've heard today about what it would mean to bring to, to what my first law professor said, what we do is connect the cosmos and the plumbing. Mm -hmm. And 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 what you all have begun doing, um, and part of what we hope with this book is to connect the, the big ideas of a right, rainbow social democracy and institution with institution building and thinking hard about the political economy we have and the and the one we deserve. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thanks, everyone.